Election systems are vulnerable to hacks, Venmo is public by default, and midterm candidates are attacked in phishing attempts. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings, I am Shannon Morse, and this is ThreatWire for July 24th, 2018, your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. Our Patreon is over at patreon.com slash threatwire, and that is always the best way to support the show and will help us reach our next goal. So if you want access to exclusives, including that brand new Discord server, check out the Patreon link below in the show notes. And special thanks to our newest patrons, including Unshra, Adrian, Jeffrey, Austin, William, Jean, and Lewis. And now on to the news. The first being election systems. So election systems and software, that's ESNS for short, is a manufacturer of voting machines and management systems across the United States. They wrote a letter to Senator Ron Wyden, a Democrat for Oregon, in April about the fact that they had included remote connection software called PC Anywhere, which anybody can download, on a small number of customer election management systems between 2000 to 2006. Motherboard obtained this letter for an article posted just last week. In case that wording is a little bit confusing, an election management system is not actually a voting machine. It's a machine that usually sits in a government office for a county, and it's used to program the voting machines as well as count those final votes. Now these should be air-gapped for obvious reasons, but in this case, PC Anywhere was installed for system admins to conduct maintenance. The systems sold by ESNS had modems connected to them to allow for remote connection connections, which could have been used as well by attackers. Now, during this time, ESNS recommended the software for immediate assistance to customers. Now, strangely, this is completely opposite of their claims that were made back in February when they explained that they had never installed remote connection software on machines to journalists for the New York Times. Now, since ESNS is the largest provider of voting machines, this could have negative connotations about their security and system integrity. The ESNS systems were used to cast at least 60% of ballots for 2006. Now, according to the letter, the PC Anywhere software was not included after 2007, at which time the Election Assistance Commission released new voting system standards that all manufacturers must abide by. Now, these standards ban any software on the voting machines that is not required and crucial for the voting and tabulation process, so of course, PC Anywhere had to be removed. Now, to make matters even worse, because the story is not done yet, attackers stole source code from PC Anywhere around the same time that ESNS was selling systems with it pre-installed. This was not made public until 2012, when Symantec responded by telling customers to uninstall it until they could update the software with patches. Now, given that many voting machines are not updated for decades, it's entirely possible that older systems still have the unpatched PC Anywhere software installed on them. And with this software and a potentially vulnerable modem, an attacker could use the management system to pop any of the voting machines connected to it. It's also entirely possible that other voting machines and manufacturers had remote access software pre-installed on their machines as well, and not just ESNS. Now, ESNS did offer to discuss the matter privately with Wyden, but they also denied a request to show up for a Senate hearing. It's unknown who their customers were that installed the remote software back in the early 2000s, and if any of those devices were hacked at all. Now, on that note, Virginia-based political campaign and robocalling company called RoboSent was serving up a whopping 2,600 files of voter records on a publicly accessible Amazon S3 server that did not require a password. This included audio recordings and spreadsheets that contained full names, addresses, political affiliations, genders and phone numbers and age and birth year and more like calculations on voting probability for hundreds of thousands of voters. Once a alerted of the data, RoboSent closed the vulnerability and said the data was old from 2013 to 2016. And according to the co-founder of RoboSent, affected voters would be alerted, and I quote, if required by law. A long time ago, one of my friends asked me to use Venmo to pay her back for some food. And when I complied and I downloaded the app, I was kind of surprised to find that many of my friends' data was publicly accessible. I could see who paid who, for what, and sometimes how much if they included that in the comment as well. Sometimes it was obviously trolling, you know who you are if you are watching this, but sometimes it was very obviously not. Concerned, of course, I told my family and friends to make sure that their Venmo account information 
information was private. Venmo transaction details are public by default, so your name, your date, and your message are all available for the entire world to see. One programmer from Berlin started a project called Public by Default to examine and track these public transactions, which could be used to develop a profile on individual users. She took this public data to curate a few profiles, blurring personally identifiable data, but keeping the transactional details. She built profiles around a weed dealer, a food cart vendor, a couple, a young woman who apparently really likes pizza, and a married couple with a dog. After her story went up on Motherboard, another coder created a Twitter bot to tweet out every single time someone makes a post on Venmo about drugs. The bot would scrape public Venmo data to find drug keywords or emojis and then repost the information on Twitter. Now, due to the overwhelming positive response and his point being made, the coder initially killed the bot. If you don't want to have your transactions publicly accessible by anyone, you can easily make them private by opening up the Venmo app, clicking on the three lines to open up your settings, go to privacy, choose private, and then choose past transactions and change all to private. Click change all to private again and then press OK. It's pretty simple. Now, while you may only use Venmo once in a while to pay a friend back or to purchase some takeout, kind of like I do, these data points can and are used to create profiles, such as the kind that political campaign and robocalling firms use. A stalker could watch your common grocery store habits to follow you home. Of course, another option is to just pay your friends back in cash, which is recommended for privacy, and Venmo should really be opt-in instead of opt-out of privacy, even if their core business model is that of a social network. During the Aspen Institute Security Summit last week, Microsoft Corporate Vice President for Customer Security and Trust, Tim Burt, stated in a panel discussion that Microsoft security team found a site run by Russian actors and that it was targeting congressional candidates during the 2018 midterm elections. Burt did not disclose who these targets were, but he did explain that they were targeted because of the possibility of disruption to the elections or for espionage. Now, this happened earlier this year, and Microsoft alerted U.S. law enforcement of the site to take it down. Burt did credit the government for their swift takedown and said the Russian attacker was not successful in their attempts. He also explained that these kind of website phishing attacks are the most popular attack by state-sponsored actors and that two-factor authentication is an excellent option to stay secure. In the case of this domain, the Russian site targeted staffers with phishing attacks that would redirect them to a spoofed Microsoft site asking for their credentials. And who exactly ran that site? Well, while no security report was publicly available, Burt did explain that the attackers were tied to the hacker group Fancy Bear, or APT28. Microsoft has been working with electoral candidates and parties for quite some time. Back in April, they started the Defending Democracy program to support state elections and authorities in security, and they also held seminars for both Democrat and Republican parties to learn about how to strengthen their own security. The Defending Democracy program specifically targets four areas of interest, protecting campaigns from hacking, increasing political advertising transparency online, exploring technological solutions for security, and defending against disinformation. Patrons, make sure to share your favorite stories in the community tab or on Discord, and every Friday I will pick three or more top stories for a voting poll that patrons can vote on to be included in next week's show. Patrons also get access to a downloadable audio version of the show, first looks at show topics, polls, discussions just for patrons, behind the scene photos, and now that Discord server just for patrons at $2 a month and up. Join now to get access to all of these and to help support the show. Now our next milestone goal gets you access to a live video Q&A, which is just for patrons at all levels, so dollar and up, doesn't matter, and gets us closer to doing a second episode each week, which I'm totally excited about. Also, a big thanks to our Hush Puppy Perk level patrons for sending in their adorable fur baby photos. I love the new one. Thank you so much. Keep them coming. They're adorbs. Hit that subscribe button or share this episode on your favorite social media page as well. And with that, I am Shannon Morse, and I will see you on the internet. Thank <laughs> you.